Hello, this is AG Billig, the founder of Self Publishing Mastery, and I welcome you to a new, to a new episode of the Self Publishing Mastery Talks. And uh, stay with me till the end because today I'm bringing you a very, very special guest. This is the kind of man that I don't know, maybe he's one in a million, you know, uh, the kind of author who is one in a million. Um, but overall, um, he's one of those larger than life people. Um, and he's one of those people who really inspire us and motivate us to give our best as authors and human beings, because his life is living proof that actually any dream is possible, that it's always possible to turn our lives around and um, create a better life for ourselves and be successful and find love and, uh, and live a life that's fulfilling and meaningful. So um, without any further ado, I want to bring to the screen Gunnar Hi. and Alan Lindblom. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> quite an introduction. Well, yeah, because you're quite a man, so you deserve this kind of introduction. And I have to say that you wrote, so the books you, you wrote, they, they, they did extremely well on Amazon. Um, people dubbed you the guy who wrote The Next Godfather. And uh, among your other accomplishments is a radio show that was very yeah i had a ra i had a radio show for two and a half years but the radio station yeah. just got bought out last week and they laid off everybody at the station so i'm got some other station host gigs lined up so i'm just going to pick the right one and start over but it was about authors it, was, it went the, my show and it still will be about authors my show will it's i bring authors on the show to promote their books tell us the story behind the story if you don't mind me just kind of getting into it i'll kind of tell you I, I, I almost every book has a has a story behind the story, and I'm, yeah. I'm the perfect example. If you were to, if you were like, okay, like you know, I, I wrote two books to be well, I wrote ten books when I was in prison for thirteen years. These two books are the first two books I published, volume one and two, to be a king. Now they're about a mafia family, and yes, people are saying that that I wrote the next Godfather, and I'm the next Mario Puzo, who's the author who wrote the Godfather. Now, if you read them and go, wow, that's a really great mafia story. That's really entertaining, incredible book. But if you look into my story and research me and read the wiki or the just go to my website or whatever, then you'll start to get it and go, wow, there's a story behind that story. And that's kind of what I would always go after on my radio show is to try and like extract the story behind the story. What inspired somebody to write what they wrote? Um, it's not. It just didn't pop out of thin air. There's usually a story that kind of comes with it. And so that's always fun. Yeah. And so uh, I, I want to make sure that our viewers and listeners heard what you said, because you said in prison. So mm -hmm. for those of us who are watching the video podcast, can you imagine this guy here who is, again, like a best-selling Amazon author spent 13 years in prison like really he spent 13 years in prison and again he has such an amazing story and he has a wikipedia page and a youtube channel with almost 10,000 subscribers if you go there you you will uh you will uh you will you will learn more more of his story and i will put the link in the you know in the description um so How'd I get out of prison? Well, uh, let yeah, me summarize a guy, that. A guy who spends 13 years in prison, excuse me, he gets to be an Amazon bestselling author and his books are now in the process of being turned into a TV series. So how is this possible? Well, so, you know, just quickly, briefly, I grew up in and around a mafia family. Um, wasn't in the mafia per se. I was around a bunch of old mobsters and uh oh, you lost me. Uh, I'll bring you right back. There I am. So so I grew up a bunch around a bunch of mobsters. It's a terrible kid, terrible child. My mother's mentally ill. My father was an alcoholic, drunk, abusive. 
I ended up in a very poor environment, expelled from school when I was 15. So I literally have a seventh grade education. Um, and then I took straight to the streets, became a drug dealer and a hustler and a gangster and all that and ended up in prison at age 29 for 13 to 50 years. They sent me away for 13, 50 years for extortion, bank robbery. And, and now I lost her. Are we still recording? That's all right. Yes. No, we are still recording. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, you, yeah. So I went away and I, uh, in prison, I decided to change my life. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be this bad guy anymore. I'd, I'd rather be a good guy. So what I did was, um, basically change everything about me. But I discovered when I was in the hole for 17 months, which is solitary confinement. If you don't know what hole is solitary confinement. Uh, I discovered I had a gift for writing. So I started writing, but here's the really remarkable part. I didn't have a pen and I didn't have paper. So I wrote in my mind and I had this gift that had this gift that God had given me. And I started writing stories in my mind over 17 months in solitary confinement, which is the hole. And then when I got out of the hole, eventually I got a paper and pen and I started writing at first. I wrote my first three novels by hand. Then I got a typewriter. I bought a prison typewriter. Matter of fact, it's right here. And I got it. I should show it to you just to show you. Yes. What I wrote all my novels on is this. Of course, wow. now I got a MacBook and I'm editing and doing all this. But this was the typewriter that I wrote all my books on in prison. Well, seven of them, six of them, excuse me. And anyways, uh, I just said, I discovered I had this very miraculous, um, totally miraculous gift. If you're a believer in God, you have to understand that. I got a seventh grade education. I was a total thug, gangster, drug dealer, bad guy in the street, whatever. And then all of a sudden, boom, I can create these stories that are people are comparing to the greatest stories in the world. I had a Fortune 200 CEO meet me for dinner after reading both of these books on his private jet and ask me to dinner and then say, dude, you're the greatest writer in the world nobody knows about. I shook his hand. I said, well, thank you. I'm working on that. Nobody gave me the blueprint on how to, you know, whatever. So... Fast forward, been doing, I mean, I've been on Fox News and all kinds of shows and podcasts and stuff like that, but I started a clothing company called Our Thing Apparel. It's kind of a mafia theme thing. It's That's the logo in the background. It's pretty cool. People, like, people buy it, and it's, it has your city on it, so whatever city you're from, it has it on there. Anyway, so, but the interesting part is, and I don't want to give you the whole story away, but I six years into my prison sentence, my uh, uh, wife stumbled across my wife today. Ooh, I didn't know at the time, stumbled across my sample chapters of my book on a Facebook page. And she wrote me and said, I work for a publisher in New York. I, you know, you're a pretty good writer. Maybe I'll read a manuscript, see if it's any good. So I had somebody turn it into a PDF and send it to her. She read it, was blown away, said it was the best book she ever read. She called me a unicorn. We became pen pals. We ended up falling in love through letters, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. We have totes filled them. And, um, and she committed her life to me. She waited seven years for me. We married mm -hmm. the day after I got out. We started our life. And um, we still have a great life. We do all kinds of exciting and fun stuff together. But um, my, the, you, the one thing you had wrong was the books. So the books have both been recently optioned for film, which gives the producer an option to make them for film. But it's actually my life. Oh, yeah, your life, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're actually making a TV series out of my life starring Armand Asante, who's an Emmy and Golden Globe winning actor. I spent six days with him this year, uh, two times in New York City, uh, three days. I spent at his house, um, basically living with him for three days, twice, and then out in L.A. to meet the producer. And so anyway, so that's... Uh, that's what I, I, this goes to show you, anyone can do anything if you put your mind to it. I think in my, I'm very blessed in regard of like the, 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 the ability for me to write the way I do is very almost divine because you'll read that and go, there's no way a, a guy with a seventh grade education gangster could write at this quality level, but I did it. And I, and I have other, all these other novels too. And that, the other novels aren't mafia genre. And right now, I was just editing before the show. I was just editing my next novel, which is about this one happens to be about two cocaine smugglers, and they're not all drugs and crime. And my, mm -hmm. I wrote sports dream, romantic comedy, action, paramilitary, all the. I, I write whatever I enjoy to read. So, uh, but it just so happens, I think the, the Snowman Chronicles, this big cocaine smuggler thing, is going to be a really big book. Because I don't know, even Armando Sante, I explained the book to him in his in his kitchen. We sat there for. 45 minutes, I told him the story, 
And he's just like, wow, that and that needs to be made a movie. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's the goal. You know what I'm saying? Let's get it done, man. You're the man. So that's what I'm trying to do. So see, that's my, my story in a nutshell. On it, on yeah, it. it's sure. like it's a very condensed nutshell. And then, and thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, and um, you're also living proof that when you, because I think, you know, when you were in prison, you had, you didn't know back then, uh, you know, notions like, uh, right to the market. There is a lot of conversation going on right now. Oh, you know, to be successful and, you know, be a full-time author, you need to write to the market. My take is that, yeah, you need to write something that people can can resonate with. And usually this is something that has to do with human emotion. But I think you just pour your heart in your life, into those books. You, you weren't thinking, oh, I'm writing these books because I want to have a movie made out of, out of those books. Well, I wrote, I, I wrote all, every one of the books I wrote was because of a book that I enjoyed. They got meaning. Mm -hmm. It's like a book. Oh, this story. I read the, the synopsis on the back. Sounds like a mm -hmm. good book. Maybe it's a good book. Sounds like I will only write what I think is good mm -hmm. because I feel like if I think a story is good, would be good, there's got to be a big market out there for, for others mm -hmm. who probably think it's good, you know? Mm -hmm. So I write for that market. Don't really plan on it. You know, I just write the story. I'm a very plot-driven writer, and anyone who's read my novels, I hope you read them and, and you finish both novels. Yes. And when you do, when you do, you're going to be like, "Oh my god!" And then you're going to understand why my wife called me a unicorn and all that. I don't know why I got that gift, but it is. But I'm plot-driven, meaning it's a very emotionally driven story. You're going to fall in love with the characters or whatever. But at the end of the story, if you're not in tears, I didn't do my job. So you, I want to be people emotionally attached. To what's in this 1100 pages so and that's how i write every single one of my books now i recently wrote a political thriller I spent a whole year writing it uh called blindsight 2030 it's about the, the year 2030 china attacks uh, america and basically wipes us out long story but it's a, kind of a political dystopian th um uh, thriller and my producer said you can't you can't uh you can't publish that while this tv series is on the, on the line because it because you'll, you'll ruffle too many feathers, you know, mm -hmm. too many people yeah. will get the cancel culture. Like, Oh, they don't agree with it. So they're going to cancel this guy. Even if it's the characters in my books that are saying a certain thing or acting a certain way, just because I wrote it, that, you know, but it wouldn't count if it was like a serial killer book. If I wrote a book about a serial killer, um, nobody's going to start calling me a serial killer because I wrote right. a book about a serial killer. But if I wrote I write a book about somebody who leans politically right or left, whoever doesn't agree with them, they're going to point at me and go, you're him. And so we said, put that book up on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Got a multi-million dollar TV project in the line. So kind of but whatever we'll publish it at some point what what makes in your opinion uh what what's what are the the crucial elements of a good story well there, there, you know this is this is goes for i'm a writing coach by the way so i i yeah. actually coach authors one of my one of my authors has had his life made into a um uh, mini series starring renee mm -hmm. zellwinger but but anyways there, there's okay so in my opinion you start with you have to establish the theme of the book in the beginning and as, and there should be lots of um um detail in the beginning you know of how people act talk walk think setting place where when what how all that but what's important is you have to have a good strong plot you have to have a, a, a good strong romantic love interest you have to have a romantic interest of some kind if you expect your book to be do well and be good you don't have to have a romantic interest but but if you don't have a romantic interest, don't expect your book to be really popular and really well. Every human being uh, is uh, after love and and has a, desires a love or, or wants to be loved or has an interest in love. So you have to have a love interest, a great conflict, of course. You have to have your main conflict, wh whatever it may be, in between two. You have to have great characters, you know what I'm saying, that are well-developed. They have you know, a certain manner. They talk a certain way. Um, however it is, and you have to have bad guys. You have to have antagonists and protagonists. So you, you want you want people to genuinely hate the bad guy and feel anger if the bad guy gets a victory or wins or gets over on the good guy. You so you have to have a good bad guy. You, you know, you know, he's not good, but he's a bad guy. But he has to be a good bad guy, somebody who was developed to the point where the reader you know hates him. And then, of course, powerful resolution. In my opinion, you'll never have a great, truly great story 
unless you can have subplots all along the second half of the story, subplots that are kind of weaving together and eventually fit together to create your overall plot and then a really impactful resolution. I mean, at the end of the, the book, um, every reader should should go, oh, wow, like, I didn't see that. I didn't, I didn't expect it. I didn't see that. Um, it, it should be where, like, dude, I get this all the time. This is volume two of my book. People, people all the time are like, dude, I'm like 60 pages from the end and I like slow down. I'm only reading one page a day. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, I don't want it to end. So I'm like, I'm just read a page here and a page there. That's how you know you got them. You've done your job as a writer. If you get it to the point where they know, in fact, they love the story so much that you don't want it to end. So they're now they're only reading a page or two at a time. Just, you know, but at the end of my book, you're the last couple of last page, you're going to go, holy ass. I, I, like I, now it all makes sense. The whole story just went boom on the last page and you'll be in tears and you'll wonder what, so what is, what happened? And then of course everybody goes, where's volume three? My wife, when she first read it, she was in tears. She was crying, mm-hmm. scrubbing her floors and all that. And she called my friend. I'm in prison, but she called my friend and, she, and he said, I finished the book. And he's like, how'd you think? He's like, it was amazing, amazing. But the way he ended it, and she's like, and then I called him shortly after, and I said, text her this. I said, ask her how she knows he's dead. And then he texts her that, and then she texts back, oh, my God, you just made my day. I can't believe it. He's alive. And I, was, <laughs> I left it. I left it in a way that you're not sure if he's dead or alive. But anyway. So how do you, um, as a writing coach, how do you – help people how, how what's the working process with with an author well the first thing i do is you know i'm not i can't write your book you, you I, I can't write your story for you all i can do is give you the elements of what makes a great story every great story has the same element it doesn't matter if you're talking about poe or 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 the iliad and, and, and the odyssey from in greek they all have the same basic general elements every great story does and again Establish the theme, uh, introduce your characters, plot, subplot, romantic interest, conflict, resolution. So if you, but so, but that there are little things that 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 really help, like developing your characters and the nuances of their characters are super important. Like people read my books and they're just like, oh, I love each one of these characters because they're so unique and they have their own little nuances. The one guy's got a, a lazy eye, the other guy's got a limp, or talks a certain way or whatever. So spend time developing in the first half of the book at least the first third of the book, um, these, these character nuances and dialogue, super important. A lot of people, a lot of authors fail. And when they, 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 here's where a lot, me, my wife is an author and she does this in her writing. And she's so used to narrating the narration part of writing. The narration part of writing is proper. It's literary, it's grammar, it's syntax, whatever. But people don't talk that way. In, in general conversation, people don't follow proper syntax and grammar and they talk a certain way so when you're writing dialogue you you should be talking ex- exactly how people sound in dialogue and not the way it sounds in narration because you have proper writing you know for writing narration in a book third party or third person whatever but when somebody goes and let's say somebody's a little a street guy he's a gangster he's gonna talk a certain way he's gonna drop f-bombs he's gonna talk a certain way, act a certain way, or he, let's say he's a Harvard professor. Well, he's going to talk a certain way too. But even him, him talking a certain way, he's not going to sound like the narration of a book. The narration of a book is is the narration of the book. It's dry. It's, it's supposed to have, there's no personality to it whatsoever. That's a mistake that people have. So what happens is they let the, the that dry third person or second person, um, or even first person. Now, if you have first person, if you're writing a first person book, which I advise don't do, it's not, it's kind of cheese y these days, but it's okay to do if you do it right. But if it's second, third person book, there should be no personality to the narration at all. It's just robotic. And then when you go into dialogue, you can't let that bleed over into your dialogue. If your, if your character starts sounding like a robotic you know, narrator, it's not real and you'll lose them and you'll lose, you'll lose the, um, 
you'll lose the the reader because it, it won't feel real. And I've had this discussion with my wife because she's such a straight shooting, like literary person. When she goes into dialogues, her dialogues often go continue from their age. I'm like, that ain't how, that's not how people talk. People talk different. She's like, oh, well, they're proper. They're educated. I don't give a crap if it's the yeah. president of the United States. Trust me, when he's alone in a room having a private conversation, he's saying F-bombs. He's saying yeah. this. He's talking a certain way. He acts a certain way. And then, if you know, if he gets on stage and has to do a, a, a presentation or something, maybe he's like, but you can't let your narration bleed into your dialogue. That's a big mistake that a lot of writers make. So what's, how, can, uh, how can an author learn good dialogue? What, what should they do? You know, I, know, I knew like uh, authors in the past, like uh, Honoré de Balzac, for example, a famous French author. He used to sit in a cafe and listen to people well, talking well, around him. Yeah, but that's what I was going to say. Well, one of the things I was going to say is, is um, listen to people talk. Just that's it. Listen to how people talk. And then try to mirror that when you're when you're writing. I just would I would I do it like how, what would I say? And I, I I'm like even if how I you know I'm kind of a street guy. He's a little more ghetto, if you will. But um, but if I I could say, well, let's suppose I was I'm a, a professional. Let's say I'm a blue collar middle aged guy who who owns a business and I make two hundred grand a year. How would I talk? We're gonna have a little bit of edge to you. You know, you're not gonna be the guy like a Harvard guy. Um, everybody's different, but whatever character you've created, he should have a certain. Believe me, if I make a military book and the and the guy's a green beret, he's gonna talk differently than you know the the, the well educated guy or or even a street guy. You know what I'm saying? He's gonna use the lingo that the lingo that the military uses. They all talk a certain way. They you know. So yeah, I would I would recommend the best way to is to listen to people talk, and you can do that from watching even YouTube videos. Because yeah. like a TV show is not real, you know what I mean? Even yeah. though a lot of the acting is so good, it seems real. Um, and you can get some dialogue from that. But if you just watch people talking and interacting, say on YouTube videos and stuff, I mean, there it is. That's how people act. That's how they talk, you know, for the most part. Some of them are on camera, so they know they're a certain way. <clears throat> so like your, your author, the French author, it's almost more realistic to go to a, a coffee shop and just listen to people how they talk because that's real. They know there's no camera there. There's yeah. no pretense. There's no recording going on. That's literally them talking. And if you want to recreate a character like that, then, you know, buy it from them. Um, earlier on, you mentioned the story behind the story. And that's something that I, you know, work with. Uh, and I tell authors when we are working on their author brand, because oftentimes I see those, you know, like those bios, I went to high school there and, you know, like, like, and oh, I you're boring. Them, you know, yeah, like the, the you need to have a story behind the story. So, what elements? Because not everybody ha has or had the life you had, right? So, not everybody's stories stories as as uh, extraordinary as yours. But everybody has some extraordinary elements in their life. So, how can an author identify those and what those elements should be, in your opinion? Well, start with. In the most remarkable parts of your life, all right? Everybody has had remarkable parts in their life. It could be traumatic. Somebody died, you were in a car accident, and it started there. Whatever, you were in the military. There's a million things. But summarize your life, your story. Don't, you know, just say. And, and then but what's more important is because they're, they're looking into the, They want to read your book, maybe. So they don't care that you went to high school, and then you went to undergrad at so-and-so. And none of that has anything to do with your book. How about this? What sparked into motion the idea and eventually the writing of your book? Start right there. You don't even need the rest. It's like one day I remember in 1982, I was driving along and bang, a bullet went through my door and I, I couldn't believe it. And next thing you know, I got this idea in my head and I said, and before you know it, it developed into a full blown story. I created these characters and eventually writing this book. And here we are. So this, whatever it is, uh, just, Tell the story that leads up to the story. There's a story there almost all the time. And I'm just hypothetically, I've heard so many. I've interviewed hundreds of authors and heard their backstories. And some of them are really remarkable. And tour, they like went on a backpacking all through Europe or they're just crazy stuff that they've done. Um, and that's the story you need to tell in your bio, not the fact that you were that you went to college and then you, uh, you know, tell that remarkable story. And that's how you're going to get, that's the most important thing to an author. I'm telling a reader, excuse me, 
Uh, they don't care about the other stuff. Tell them what makes, why would your book be remarkable? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean this? They read the bio and go, oh, geez, that guy had a freaking crazy time in Russia, you know what I mean, or whatever it is. And it just sounds interesting. He's lived an interesting life. The odds of this guy creating interesting characters are very good because based on the life that he's lived, he's encountered a lot of crazy and interesting characters for him to vet, like to work with and develop and pull from in creating characters and story or whatever on on so that's important what are the most like the typical questions you get from your um from your readers what do they want to know about you or your they want to know how much my they want to know how much my book is real is based on real mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. i get a lot of that i tell them there's some, there are some things in the book that are inspired or there are some characters that were loosely inspired by true characters, some more than others. There are some events that were inspired, but they're all minor. They're all very minor compared to the book. They're just like little things, you know, but it was enough. And the other thing is, is like, they're like how much of like, how much, like how close was this world to your world growing up? And um, in some ways, very much so like the world, in some ways, almost nothing. It's just, it's, I was around the mafia enough to glean uh, enough information for my superpowered imagination to mm -hmm. write this. Right, right. I wasn't in the mob. I wasn't in the, in the upper echelons of the mob. I wasn't in the room with high level mob guys. They'd come over. They'd have coffee with my grandpa. They'd, they'd you know, smoke a cigar or have a cannoli. But they weren't. They were speak Sicilian. I didn't know what the hell they're saying. But I was around them, so I'd see it. And I was able to see enough of that world and the characters and how they moved, talked, walked, acted, the whole organization of how it worked, tears and everything. I'm like, I got enough to where I could recreate and create this thing. But it's not, um, you know, it's, it's – and another thing is that one thing they ask me, that the people who read uh, my books are like, how the hell did you do that, man? You got a seventh-grade education. Yeah. Like, how do you – because they're really well written. I actually toned down the writing. Originally, they were probably written at like a you know fifth, four, fifteen gr grade level writing, and my my wife was like, "You just use too many big words. It's too literary. You got to dial it down because the average reader is an eighth, ninth grade reader level, which is normal. That's fine. It's what most people do. So I had to dial it down. But the people who read my books are like, "Jesus, man, how the heck did you do this?" I'm like, "I I, I read about a hundred books." <laughs> They're like, "So you read a hundred books, and then you're able to write like this?" Mm -hmm. I'm like. You know, if your mind is designed to do that, you know, it doesn't take thousands of books. It just takes a hundred. Um, that, that's another question I was, you kind of anticipated. How, how did you, once you realized you have this gift for writing, how did you cultivate, how did you cultivate it and, you know, like enhance it? Well, I knew I discovered I, I, I could do create these stories, at least in my mind. Mm -hmm. While I was in the hole for 17 months, a, a solitary confinement, so I'm locked up 24 hours a day in a cage. Um, yeah. And so I created these stories from beginning to end, and it may take me two or three months, four months. So to create this story in my head, it took about four months, all day, every day. I did push-ups, whatever, but I'm thinking about the story, creating mm -hmm. from beginning to end. Um, so I didn't get a chance to really sit down and write till till I was out of the hole. But... How did I cultivate it? it was just working. Just I, I, I sat down and wrote my first book. Took a year. Handed it to guys. They loved it. Sat down. Wrote my next book. Took about a year. Handed it wow. to guys. They loved it. Sit down. Wrote my next book. And I just got better and better. You know, I didn't even have a dictionary or a thesaurus for the first three books. I still have the original manuscripts right here. Mm -hmm. And I was not a great speller either. That's one thing. God played a game. Uh, God played a joke on me. I, I'm not a great speller. I have a pretty good grasp of con uh, like syntax and, and grammar, but, but it's not a great speller. It was, it was terrible at spelling. And so I wrote by hand these three books, but I got better every time I went and, and I was able to, the structure and format I was pretty good at from reading that yeah. hundred book. But then I got a typewriter and taught myself to type and I just taught myself to get better and better. Very critical on the right. I editing over and over and mm -hmm. over and over and over until, until I got it to where I was happy with it. And then um, it was very, I got I had a lot of confidence from, because all the guys in prison are big readers. 
and they're reading my books saying that these are the best books they've ever read. I'm not joking. When a guy who re who's been in prison for 20 years and he says, I've read 10,000 books over the last 20 wow. years. I don't even have a TV. All I do is read. Mm -hmm. And then I hand him a book. And two days later, he comes back with this 1,100 page manuscript and goes, dude, that's the best book I've ever read, man. Why are you in prison? How did you end up in prison? Like, mm -hmm. you're like the most talented person I've ever met in my life. And you lock in prison with me. It makes no sense. Why are you here? I'm like, you know, I just got caught up, man, like anyone else. I didn't even know I had this gift until I, they're like, dude, you're going to be something when you get out someday. And I'm like, thank you. So I, that was gave me a lot of confidence. And I just kept, kept cultivating and writing and getting better and better and better. And I still get better. I'm still getting better all the time. You know, any real writer will tell you, you're never going to hit the, the apogee or apex of your, your writing career where you just can't get better. In fact, a real writer will always tell you, it's like, I mean, I'm a long ways from where I could be, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, you're always evolving and getting better as a writer, and that's just a writer. Is to, by writer, I mean creator. I mean anyone can write. Anyone can learn how to write. That's easy. Um, but any, but not anyone can learn how to create and storytell. That's the hard part, you know. Yeah. For yeah. for some, and then creating yeah. and storytelling is mm -hmm. really the art. Yeah. And writing, you anyone can go to school and learn how to write a book. It's easy. Will it be good? Probably not. You know, unless you have that natural knack or gift for it you know that's the thing so do you nowadays do you have a writing routine or you know some people say oh you know you need to re to write for two hours a day or you need to write 500 words a day something but do it daily if you want to get better do it daily don't don't let a day go by without doing it well i'm a full-time writer so i write every day all day so i mean it's like i'm downstairs right now for the last like four hours been editing my book um, so my chronicles, you know, I have other things that I do. I have the apparel company, I have the radio show. I have, mm -hmm. um, book marketing campaigns. You know, I'm a book marketing manager for, for authors. I I've gotten really good at doing marketing campaigns and exposing people's books to large markets. And, um, you know, I'm not like one of these Nigerian guys who, who say, hello, hi, I see you're an author on, you know, from LinkedIn or something. Oh, no, 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 no. No, yeah, uh, no. And actually, uh, I know because that's how we met, actually. And uh, I want to discuss a little bit about this since you brought this up. Um, and I know you're going to help me with my uh, rock star romance. And we are going to bring it out into the world together, uh, working with you as a book marketer. Uh, but I actually, I, I, uh, I met Gunnar in a Facebook group. Uh, it's called uh, Need a Need a Guess. Uh, it's a it's a it's a group on, on Facebook where people yeah. who have podcasts or people who are looking for podcasts are you know coming together, and um, that's the power of Facebook groups. And I know you've been uh, this is one of your secret weapons, so to speak, when you market when you help authors with their books, like using the leverage the power of Facebook groups. So can you tell us about? Well, Facebook groups and there's just it's a kind of a complex thing to talk about with with Facebook groups. But if you go on, if you want to try to market your book on Facebook and you say I'm going to do a sponsored ad and they're like and you say for I'll say for how much and say fifty dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then for fifty dollars and so it doesn't target groups and pages. It, it just targets people and you say what age demographic, mm -hmm. what geological location. Um, you know, men, women, whatever, whatever, and you type in them all, and then you say, "Go spend fifty dollars," and it says you will reach twelve thousand people. Twelve thousand people for fifty dollars, right? Meanwhile, I belong to three hundred Facebook pages in groups that have a total number of about three million uh, uh, subscribers, followers, or whatever. And some of them are doubles or triple. You know, some of them belong to both, all of them. What? So, but it's really like, it's a couple of million people for, for sure, mm -hmm. right? Now, most of those pages and groups, I'd say about half of them you can't publish in. You can't you can't post a promotion for your book. They don't allow it. The admins mm -hmm. don't allow it. It's just kind of good that they do that. Otherwise, everybody's spamming it all day. Yeah. So, but they allowed me because I have had this radio show for a couple of years where I've had a tie-in, had authors, best-selling authors, Pulitzer Prize winning authors, Netflix producers, authors, and I say, hey, listen, I have this radio show. Would you mind if I promote a, a, an author or two every now and then in your group or your page? And they're like, yeah, you can. So what I do is organically post, I, I 
uh, construct very high end, very well articulated, very professional um, promotional uh, for books. And let's say it's my book, and it, I might use uh, the cover of the book, and then it'll be a little synopsis or blurb of the book, a little story about me, blah 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 blah. And then I go in one at a time and publish a promo at this group or page. And I do it for like 300 of them, like twice a week. So I can only handle like, because it takes hours and hours and hours to do it. But I'll do it for, I charge 500 a month or 850 for two months. Like twice a week, I'll put your book in front of millions of readers. These are people who subscribe to these pages and groups because they love books, they love reading, or they're involved in publishing somehow. Most of them are just regular people who love books and love reading. So they go there, or they or they could be authors. But they, whatever the case is, these are millions of people who love books and authors. So I put this promotion in front of them. Then I go to the next one, click the next one. And like I said, so you could spend $50 to promote to 12,000 people mm -hmm. who aren't even readers. They're just men and women of your demographic that you're reaching, trying to reach. Or you can come to me and for 500 bucks, for a month straight, I can get you in front of millions of people, which often results in a lot of book sales. You know, and a lot of it comes down to your book. Is your book good? I don't know. If the book is good, it'll sell. People will buy it. If it's not, so so much. With self publishing, it's you know, yeah, anybody can publish anything. I've seen right. some horribly, horribly bad mm -hmm. books where the the person who wrote it was like, yes, you know, like, my book is awesome. And like, no book is terrible you should have never published it and then you have some that are that are published amazing books that are amazing those books people will read if i write a synopsis and a blurb on like a blurb with this the cover of the book and all this this nice well formatted pro promotion at these groups and pages uh a reader might say will say well that sounds interesting and they'll click the link and they'll go to the book and they'll go oh this book sounds good i want to read this and buy it you know so that's that's what I do as a book marketing manager. I do it organically, so it's one by one by one by one by one. There's no mass email. There's no uh, search engine optimization. I literally take a high end promotion that I put together and and deliver it right to groups to have. I'd say the average group probably has twenty thousand uh, followers, but when you have three hundred of them, it adds up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if, a, if an author wants to join uh, Facebook groups for book marketing purposes, and I want to say that building the relationships, not only with the readers, but with other authors is part of the book marketing process, because you need to build these relationships, you need to build trust, otherwise people won't be interested in helping you or buying. But um, what would be like a good Facebook group to join? What should they look at when they are... So I have, I, I belong to th like 300 pages mm -hmm. and groups. Mm -hmm. I won't say any are better than others. I prefer, I stay away from the ones that are wide open. Mm -hmm. The ones that allow anybody to post yeah. on it, me or you or anybody else. If they, if you're a lot, if you can just go post in a group. Yeah. The problem with that is what you get is tons of like Nigerian scammers and sure. scump spammers and and porn spammers and and there's there's no real content there that's relevant to you. Now the ones that have admins that block all that crap and and, and they only allow certain people there to post. Um, you could even reach out to them maybe and say, hey, I'm pro I'm releasing a new book. Would you mind if I promoted it for a couple of days here or whatever? They might say, yeah, okay, and then make the post and we'll approve it. But with me, because I'm who I am, they're just like, yeah, you're good, man. They approve just about everything I, I, I publish, you know. But I don't make it crazy. I don't do spam. Like, I don't do tons. Twice a week, that's it. So two, once once every like, four days, I'll make a, a promotional post for an author. And by the way, and I'll turn down if a, book's, if a book sounds really bad, like, you know, based on a conversation with the author. I'd rather not even take his money yeah. and, and I'd rather just, you know, I'm not the guy because I want to promote good authors, you know. Uh, what other tools are you using to promote books besides Facebook? What are your favorites for, for your own books, let's say? Um, well, having a website helps, obviously, you know, there's, there's some search engine optimization there. Um, YouTube has helped, you know, where I'm able to promote my book using my YouTube channel. 
And but that's kind of run its course too. It's a weird. Mafia genre is a weird thing. It's just a weird thing. Mo most people who are obsessed with the mafia are like into true crime, mm -hmm. and then they're like, "Oh, this is like this guy Gunner. You know, he he, he was like a real guy in mob." And then they and then they're like, and then they find out I wasn't in the mob. Like I wasn't a made guy, and I I, I don't talk like Tony Soprano. Hey, Tony, Paulie, bring me paper, man. bring me cigar, because I, I don't sound like that. My last name's Lindblom, even though my mother's name is Toko. My 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 mother. My last name is Toko. That's my Sicilian half, and the boss of the Detroit Mob was, was was Jack Toko. And but but people they look they look into me and they're like, oh, you don't he don't talk like Tony. He ain't no mobster, huh? And these guys, so they don't buy my books. They they want to they want like true crime crap. The average person who reads my books is like yourself, <laughs> like is a, a woman, mature woman or middle aged man who just. Want to read a good story? Somebody said this is an amazing book. You got to check it out, and he does. It has nothing to do with mob fans and groupies, so that's not. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a great, the greatest marketeer in terms of uh, that. But I've really gotten good at marketing on Facebook. Um, Instagram is really kind of waste. I mean, obviously, good. There's things like Goodreads and, and um, Reddit, and there's a lot of different um, places. To, to publish and if you get if you master them or get good at them i haven't only thing i've gotten really kind of really good at is the facebook mm -hmm. part of it and it's taken me years to kind of algorithm basically it's a hack i call it a, a facebook uh, algorithm hack because i can organically and for free reach a hundred times more people yeah. than if i paid for facebook to you know the same like 500 bucks to reach people and they, but they also go, okay, sure, you can do that, Gunner, but it's going to take you a lot of work. They're gonna, they make it really hard. They make it really hard. Now, if you, let, let's say you wrote a book about a mafia book and you, you said, I'm going to pay $50. Facebook has got 2 billion subscribers. So you're saying, $50, I should at least reach 2 million, right? No. For $50, the amount of no. 2 billion. Uh, and then you'd also say, and then if, if it was like, it's a mafia book. Let's say it's a mafia book. So you would punch in mafia as the keyword, uh, ages 25 to 55, men primarily in the United States, whatever. Facebook won't market that ad to groups that are about the mafia. So there's, there's, there's hundreds of Facebook pages and groups that are mafia related. They're like fan pages and groups. Mm -hmm. But that promotion that you, that you pay to do to reach people who might want to be read a book about a mafia, it will not reach them. Yeah. They want you to pay more. They, yeah. they say, oh, well, it'll reach them if you pay $800, but not 50 or whatever. So that's, I said, screw them. I'll go to the back door and do it myself. Yeah, yeah. That's the way to do it. I mean, um, until you you have like a ton of money to spend on ads. Yeah. Uh, you don't you need know. a ton of money. To, to spend on marketing, but it, I, my advice, I tell students when they hire me to be a, a um, coach, I said, what is your marketing budget? Well, I don't have a marketing budget. I said, well, you should probably come back when you have one. When because, you have one, yeah. Yeah, you, you can't just write a book and not ha have a budget. I, minimum marketing budget, I would say, is five grand. That's minimum. It sounds like a lot of money, but if you plan to make money from your book, you're going to mm -hmm. need five grand, you know? This on the average, the average book is going to, to, for you to make all the money back and the time and effort and energy and everything, including the five grand, you're going to need to spend five grand to get the ball rolling. Because if you how don't, would you, how would you huh? divide this money? How would you, well, would there's, you well, there's hiring somebody like me, for example, mm -hmm. um, book marketing manager. I'm 850 for two months. That's a big help. Radio appearances, um, you know, sponsored ads in the right places. Mm -hmm. Um, there's different there's there's different podcasts and things like that are focused on you know there are podcasts that get you know like five hundred thousand downloads yeah. a month right mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they're all about books well all you got to do is pay them like five hundred bucks to go on their show yeah. so you go on their show he's like I'm gonna you know five hundred bucks to come on your show and spend half an hour talking about my book that's a half a million people. Are going to read mm -hmm. or hear about your book. If you sound like you got a good book and you sell it well, 
you could you you could make five grand and one yeah. appearance. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Just from one appearance. Well, that's what big publishers do. That's the big publishers do when they, when they go to market a new book. It's like a they, they might have a fifty thousand dollar budget, and they they have their people figure out where and how, what, whatever, and uh, and that's how they make the money back. If you're a big author, you're going to get a fifty thousand dollar advance on your book, right? But you're not really getting an advance because they're going to take the first fifty thousand dollars that they make to pay back the advance. And they're going to use – so that first 50000 is going to be for marketing. So, I mean, if you, like I said, here's fifty grand in advance, and we're spending fifty grand on marketing. So you don't make a dollar until you make 100000 off the book. Yeah, true. true. But that's how – but that's the thing. If it's done that way, you can make a lot of – you can make hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars. And they yeah. know that. That's how they do it. Yeah. Wow. That's That's been a, like a, almost – we are at – almost an hour 45 minutes in we would we, we could go on for another hour i'm pretty sure I'm but sure. um you already gave our our viewers our listeners so much value already thank you so much for you're welcome you're welcome for being here with us today so how can they uh contact you if they want to to work um, with you what's the best way to to reach you well my my email is like if you want to talk about coaching or marketing like marketing campaigns or coaching, just uh, hit me at gunnerdetroit at gmail.com. That's my, my email is gunnerdetroit at gmail.com. It's available at my website, by the way. If you go to my website, gunnerdetroit.com, that's ticking on the bottom, and just click on contact, send me an email. Um, you go to my YouTube uh, channel, Gunner Detroit or, or Gunner Limblum, either or it'll search up. And then on Facebook, I'm Gunner. I have author Gunner Allen Limblum is the page you can find me at. And that's it. That's it. Well, thank you so much again for being here with us today. And um, we are looking forward to the TV series based on your life. And then you. seeing your books on the big screen as movies. And uh, we hope to have you back at some point to talk some more about your story and about marketing. I thank you so much. I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me. God bless everybody. Don't give up. Dreams come true. You can do it. You got this. Write that book. Publish that book. Be that guy. You can do it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for uh, being here with us today. Self-Publishing Mastery Talks returns next week. In the meantime, keep writing and keep self-publishing. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>